Hi, and welcome to the Simulation Step Up series. My name is Ramesh Lakshmipati. I'm a Senior Technical Sales Specialist with Dassault Systems Solvix Corporation. Now, in this presentation, we'll review part one of modeling pin connectors in SolidWorks simulation. So let's get started. So why connectors? Well, connectors connect two or more parts of an assembly together. They can transfer loads between parts of the assembly. They can also resist and take on preloads as well as external loads. In SolidWorks simulation, there's a wide variety of connectors to choose from, like the spring, pin, bolt, bearing connectors, spot wells, edge wells, links, rigid connection, and so on. Now, these connectors are virtual, meaning there's no geometry required for simulation setup, and hence there's no stress calculations done. However, SolidWorks simulation does report a few different types of loading to help with the sizing of these connectors, like the axial forces, shear forces, bending moment, and torque. Now in this presentation, we'll actually focus on the pin connector and more importantly, how to use this feature to build more representative models and make more meaningful design decisions. So we'll first review the basic concepts and terms related to the pin or riveted joints. We'll then go ahead and introduce or review the interface and some many options for the pin connectors in SolidWorks simulation. We'll then also look at the assumptions that are inherent in the pin connector feature, since it's important to understand what these assumptions are and what's going on behind the scenes. Now, one important assumption for the use of pin connectors is that they represent a short fastener with respect to the features they're interacting with. So we'll walk through a simple test model that explores the ramifications of this assumption in more detail. And finally, we'll conclude with a general discussion of pin joint failure and what aspects of the spin connector in SOLIDWORKS simulation can be used to predict failure. So in any assembly involving fasteners, whether they be bolts, pins, rivets, or even more complex joining methods such as weldments, understanding the load and the load paths is really important to ensure proper sizing for joint performance and reliability. The simple systems as the one illustrated here a designer can often estimate these loads in bending axial and shear using free body diagrams and hand calculations. However, as the systems become more complex in nature, the load paths become redundant and estimating fastener loads becomes nearly impossible without tools like SOLIDWORKS simulation that can actually evaluate an entire elastic system. So the connectors in SOLIDWORKS simulation have been implemented to address this scenario in complex systems. So when designing pin or riveted joints, some assumptions are helpful in the initial sizing and placement of fasteners. And these assumptions are typical across industries through, uh, although exceptions always exist on a case specific basis. For manual fastener calculations, it is assumed that the loads are carried equally by all the fasteners. This eliminates the need for determining local component stif stiffness. It is also helpful to assume that the only load the fastener must carry is the shear load and that bending axial or some combination of the three doesn't really exist. This is often a stretch in anything but the most simple systems. Another assumption is that the shearing stress is uniform across the cross section. Now again, this too is difficult to make for large fasteners. Also, it's commonly assumed that the load a fastener takes in shingle shear is twice what that same fastener may actually take in a double shear situation. This is again interdependent upon the prior assumptions of load uniformity. It essentially allows simplification of the fastener selection process. The final two assumptions on bearing stress and the tensile stress again go towards load uniformity and are based upon an idealized component situation. They most certainly do not hold true for moderately complex systems. Now, many of these assumptions we just talked about my, where a designer might need uh, for manual calculations of fastness and joints really go away when the problem is solved in a tool like SOLIDWORKS simulation. A finite element model can account for more complex stiffnesses and load paths, eliminating the need for assumptions. However, a pin connector is still an idealized an analysis feature and doesn't provide feedback on the stress distribution within the cross-section. So if you anticipate a more complex stress field, 
you may actually want to model the fastener as a solid body using contact conditions and solid simulation. We'll be discussing some tips with this technique later on in this presentation. And finally, the assumption that the load and double shear pin is half that of a single shear pin still makes sense as it goes to the tabulated allowables for pins in standard engineering references. Now, this again isn't a modeling assumption, but really a design criteria. So it isn't impacted either way by the fidelity of the model. Bottom line is that by using solid simulation and connectors to model fasteners, you can get a much more informative model of a fasten system than using any other traditional method. The pin connector provides an idealized model of a generic a cylindrical fastener. Most typically these are pins or rivets. A bolt can be considered as a cylindrical fastener as well, but due to preload and head nut washer interactions, a bolt connector feature was specifically designed in solid simulation to handle just bolts. In the case of a bolt with no preload, you can get pretty much the same effect as a pin as long as the local results are not so important. Now internally in FEA terms, when you select two cylindrical faces in the definition of a pin, each face is constrained using a mathematically rigid method to a central point as illustrated in this particular picture. And those two central points are then tied up using a beam entity with variable stiffnesses based on further user input. A user can control both the axial, translational, as well as rotational relative motion between the central points. So on one extreme, they can be rigidly tied in both translation as well as rotation, so the giant pretty much behaves as a spot well. On the other extreme, there can be no stiffness in either directions, and the giant behaves like a loose-fitting pin. And finally, a user can define some finite stiffness to the giant in either or both directions based on knowledge of the expected actual giant. Now let's take a look at the definition of the pin connector. The pin obviously connects two or more parts. The big assumption here is that the pin remains straight. It does not actually bend. And the selected faces for the pin definition move as a rigid body. There is no deformation on those faces. Those faces also must be coaxial. And most importantly, the geometric centers cannot be coincident. So keep that in mind. Now you can select multiple faces from the same part, but they again must be coaxial and have the same radius. And one of the nice things about a pin connector is it can actually start and end on the same part or on the same body. In terms of connections, you can control if the pin is going to translate, meaning you can fix axial translation if required. And you can also go ahead and fix the rotation about the pin axis by selecting the no rotation option. Now, if the finite stiffness is desired for rotation or translation, you must specify a stiffness for that direction. And remember that this is a spring stiffness, not a friction coefficient. So you will not be able to reliably model the effects of friction by using a stiffness in this matter. And if friction in the pin is required, actually modeling the solid fastener and applying contact conditions with friction is probably a best bet. So it is your responsibility to choose an elastic stiffness that best represents your actual system. And the good starting place may be to estimate the spring stiffness using a solid rod approximation as shown here with your actual pin geometry. And the equations are shown for this in case of a, a, a torsion rod as well as a tension rod type of scenarios. And if the results of interest are sensitive to variations in this particular stiffness value, you may actually want to reiterate a few times to get this number right. And finally, with the pin connector, you can also account for the mass of the pin as, so that if the weight is significant enough or contributes to the vibration issues, uh, we're not discounting that effect. Now, the strength data option helps to determine if the pin can safely carry the applied loads or is it going to fail. So you can input a known tensile stress area of the pin and the pin strength can be user defined or can be set equal to yield strength if the pin material is selected from the material library. Again, this is used for safety factor calculations and we'll review some basic material information in the next slide. But keep in mind the material properties and the tensile stress area, they're not used to realistically represent the stiffness of the pin. Instead, the pin forces are calculated based on assumptions that the pin is very stiff. Now you can also input a desired factor of safety to make sure the pin is going to be fail safe. And so the program behind the scenes calculates the axial bending and the shear loads uh, during the analysis uh, 
and then comes up with the axial uh, load ratio, bending load ratio, and shear load ratio uh, to ultimately calculate the, uh, the calculated factor of safety. And this calculated factor of safety is then compared to the desired factor of safety to de determine if the pin is going to pass or fail. Now, what's really powerful about uh, the fact that the pin check plot is available as part of the simulation results uh, and is shown right here on the bottom right corner. So this is great in getting good visual feedback right away, allowing for more rapid and instant decisions to be made on the pins. Now, when the strength data option is selected, additionally, the program requires material properties that can be custom defined or the material itself can be selected from a library. Now, if the library material is selected, the program copies properties such as Young's modulus or elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, and the coefficient of thermal expansion values. Now, keep in mind that these properties are simply read in and will not change the material properties uh, in the library changes. So, bottom line is the pin definition is not linked back to the material in the library, meaning you will have to reread the material if you end up making any, ch any changes to the material in the database. Now, once a pin connector has been created and the, and the simulation study is solved, a summary of forces for each pin can be found uh, by right mouse clicking on the results folder and choosing, list, choosing the list connector forces option. And you can look at the results on a single or on all pins. And here in the table shown, I have selected to show results for all the pin connectors. And it's always a good practice to rename the connectors in the feature tree so that you can eventually identify them easily in the uh, results list. You also have the option to save the results for the currently displayed pin as a CSV file or into an Excel spreadsheet format that can be opened and manipulated uh, for further use. And for example, I often take these values and calculate stresses based on my pin geometry and use standard beam calculations in a spreadsheet to determine if the fasteners are under design or not. Here are some guidelines for creating pin connectors. Remember that these represent solid or non-crushing fasteners. Many pins and rivets are hollow and allow for radial compression that can factor into the actual model results. And so if this is the case, use an explicit solid representation of your fastener. Also, the pin connector is overly stiff, so it cannot bend or interact with the through holes in any fashion due to the mathematically rigid connection that defines the pin connector. So the through holes chosen can never X-shape as you might expect a hole to do when in contact with the pin. The two holes will always remain coaxial. And again, if you think this is an issue, try a test model using a solid pin. Avoid using symmetry if the symmetry plane especially cuts through the connector, uh, through the cross section or through the shank length. The pin is assumed to have a line to line fit with no radial clearance but this does not actually represent a press fit condition. Again, these are often important characteristics of the pin to understand. So you might actually want to consider a solid representation to capture this behavior if it factors into your problem. And finally, ensure that a no penetration local contact condition is defined between the connected components. This is important so the pin carries the load instead of the part to part bonded contact. One tip on contact is if you have many face pairs that you actually want bonded beyond the ones local to pins, set your global contact to bonded, but make sure you go back and define the local contacts for the faces at the pin. I would strongly recommend reviewing the Simulation Step Up series episode on contact modeling and solid simulation to learn about some tips and pointers, best practices, especially when it comes to contacts in your assembly. All right. That concludes this presentation. You can watch this presentation as well as several other presentations as part of the Simulation Step Up series on the Simulation YouTube channel. I'll see you next time. Thanks and have a great day.